video, we're going to start talking more in depth about vital signs. So first up is temperature. If we so vital sign, right? We know there are uh, six vital signs. Basically, we have to know one is temperature, pulses, respiratory rate, blood pressure, right? And two more is one is the pain. Other is the? Pulse oximetry. Yes, oximetry, oxygen. Thank you so much. Oxygen delivery is important. So first one, she's going to talk about the temperature. So in this portion, we are going to talk the what are the expected range of temperature and what are the oral, rectal, axillary, and temporal temperature. And what are the factor impact the body temperature. But before to start this small recording, I want to tell something. We need to know two terminology. One is hyperthermia, other is hypothermia. So if I tell you, what does it mean? You can say hyper means something is more. Hypo means something is less than normal. Hyperthermia. When we tell my patient has a hyperthermia, when the temperature is over 39 degree Celsius. So obtain the, if patient has hyperthermia, we should obtain the blood culture or specimen to find out what are the underlying organism causes the infection and patient temperature is so high. Definitely if your patient has a hypothermia, we have to give some antibiotic or antipyretic. Antipyretic means what is reduce the body temperature or fluid is doctor order because we always give the medication as prescription here. So as I told you, and if patient has hypothermia, definitely we have to give something to prevent the shivering or provide the blanket if patient is having the chill. We are LRN, we are um, LPN. This is our main focus to comfort the patient and also awareness to the healthcare provider before any emergencies. We talk about hypothermia, another terminology is hypothermia. Hypothermia means temperature under 35 degree Celsius. And if patient has hypothermia, we have to provide some warm blanket or warm IV fluid, increase the room temperature and also keep the head is covered. So go next what she explained. If we are taking a patient's temperature orally, we would expect their temperature to be between 36 and 38 degrees Celsius. So, okay. so she going to explain uh, temperature in the different side of the body. If we take the oral temperature, it should be the normal range would be 36 to 38 degree Celsius. Average is 37 degree Celsius. If we take the rectal temperature, it would be 0.5 degree higher than the oral. If we take the temperature in the axilla, 
it would be 0.5 degree lower than the oral. If we take the temperature temporally, dear, it would be 0.5 degree higher than the normal. What are the normal? 36 to 38 degrees Celsius, right? an average of 37 degrees Celsius. If we are taking their rectal temperature, then this will be about half a degree Celsius higher. So an average of 36.5 to 38.5 degrees Celsius. For axillary temperature, this will be a little lower. So it'll be a half a degree lower. So with a range of 35.5 to 37.5 degrees Celsius. And then if we're taking the temporal um, temperature, this will also be a half a degree higher, just like with rectal, so with a range of 36.5 to 38.5 degrees Celsius. So here are some factors that will impact temperature. So newborns will have a lower temperature than, say, an adult. So we would expect a range between 36.5 and 37.5 degrees Celsius. Older adults will also have a lower temperature than say just like mid-range adults. So their average may be around 36 degrees Celsius. There are some things that can increase an individual's temperature. So these things include hormonal changes such as, such as menstruation, ovulation, and menopause. Exercise can also increase temperature, dehydration, and illness are other things that can increase an individual's um, temperature. Also, food, fluids, and smoking can impact oral temperature. So if someone has just, you know, down some ice water, that's probably not a good time to take their temperature because that will definitely impact um, the reading that you get. Okay. Uh, now, uh, she explained here, what are the factors? that impact your body temperature, right? Like you are a RN and you are ready to measure the patient temperature, you have to make sure last 30 minutes, they did not take any hot drinks like coffee or they never smoke, right? Because they impaired the normal measurement. She explaining here, the newborn, newborn have a lower temperature, means it should be lower than 36 to 37 degrees Celsius. Or older adult have a lower temperature as well. Older adult, average is, is average 36 degrees Celsius. And some things that increase the temperature, like hormonal change. If anybody's hormone is imbalanced, temperature will be imbalanced. Now you can ask me, when our body hormone fluctuate, example, like menstruation, during the menstruation, female body temperature is a little bit higher during the ovulation or menopause. Even if you go the physical exercise, you know that, right? Your body temperature increase. If anybody is dehydrated, body temperature increase. If anybody is a get infected, by any bacteria, pathogen, infection, causes the increase the temperature or illness. Some of the food or fluid or smoking can impact the oral temperature, right? So now we go to talk about the Oral, we have done the rectal temperature, the tympanic temperature, and temporal temperature. 
Mr. B, sorry. We are taking a patient's temperature via the rectal route. We're going to place them in the SIMS position, which we talked about when we were talking about bed positions, and we're going to definitely use lubrication. We're going to insert the thermometer between one and one and a half inches for adults. We do not want to take a rectal temperature for babies under three months old or for patients who are at high risk for bleeding because we definitely don't want to perforate you know, the colon and then have a, a major bleeding issue. When so NCLEX board like this question. NCLEX board like, what said she explained here? Like if you feel or if you need or if prescription order, if we need to take the temperature rectally, maybe you can ask me why I go to the measurement, the temperature rectal area. Answer is if your patient is unconscious, if your patient has any kind of um, like vomiting, right? That times the mouth or oral temperature is not an ideal, right? So would, if my patient is changed the consciousness or unconscious, we never ever put anything in their mouth. That times we have to choose the alternative route. Also, it is important if your patient have a, if you need you measure the temperature rectally, you have to make sure patient do not have any disease in rectal area or patient does not have any bleeding tendencies. So a question and clicks would ask frequently if patient need to measure the temperature rectally, what should be the ideal position of the patient? The ideal position or place the patient in seems position. Always we have to use some lubricant before. Also, how much insert the thermometer? We have to insert thermometer one to 1.5 inches for adult uh, patient. And no rectal temperature we have to measure if the patient is babies under three months old, or if patient is the high risk for bleeding, like rectal um, bleeding, rectal carcinoma, or any kind of perforation is there, or fistula, we do not uh, check rectal temperature. Taking the tympatic temperature for adults, you're going to want to pull the ear up and back. And then for children under three years old, we're going to pull the ear down and back. Mm -hmm. This is the question and place would super light, okay? Extremely light. When we check the tympanic temperature, means anything. Tympanic means tympanic bone just behind the ear. But if we have to check the tympanic temperature for adult, we have to pull the ear up and back. But if we check the tympanic temperature for children under three years old, pull the ear down and back. So in case of adult, it is up and back, but in case of children, it is down and back. So come on, both are back, but adult, it is up. In case of children, it is down. So also, if any excess ear wax can impact the tympanic membrane. So as a RN, you have to make sure. Excess earwax can impact, impact tympatic temperature. So that's something to keep in mind if you've got a patient with a bunch of earwax. And then for temporal temperature taking, you're going to slide the probe across the forehead, 
to the hairline and then touch the soft depression under the patient's ear. This temporal temperature, right? So temporal temperature, we have to slide the probe across the forehead or across the forehead to hairline. Also touch the soft depression behind the ear. So let's now talk about some interventions for either hyperthermia, which is a temperature over 39 degrees Celsius, or hypothermia, which is a temperature under 35 degrees Celsius. So for a patient with hyperthermia, chances are we're going to need to obtain blood cultures. So that was just standard practice, um, and it happened at night a lot because it seems like patients are getting that fever overnight. If they get a temperature over 39 degrees, we're taking blood cultures and possibly other specimens. We're going to likely administer antibiotics, antipyretics, which are medications used to bring the temperature down, and fluids as ordered. So we want to prevent shivering with the patient, so we need to provide blankets if the patient is having chills and if they're shivering. For hypothermia, so again, this is for a temperature under 35 degrees Celsius, we want to provide warm blankets. Potentially, we're going to be giving them warmed IV fluids. We can increase the room temperature and also keep their head covered because we lose a lot of heat from our head. All right, so that's it. Those are the key points with temperatures. So we are going to move to pulses now. So when we are assessing a patient's pulse, we are assessing the rate, the rhythm, the equality, and the strength. So the rate, the normal rate for adults is between 60 and 100 beats per minute. So for infants, it's going to be much higher, like 120 to 160 beats per minute. We're going to assess the rhythm, so it's either going to be regular or irregular, just one or the other. And then equality is basically we're comparing the right side pulse to the left side pulse. For some patients, that may be different, and that's an important finding to report to the provider. And then we're assessing the strength of the pulse. So the strength will either be zero, which means the pulse is absent, one plus, which means the pulse is diminished, or two plus, that is a normal finding. So two plus is like normal pulse. Three plus means it's a strong pulse. And then four plus means they have a bounding pulse. So let's now talk about where to take the radial pulse and the apical pulse. Okay, so here she explained the pulses, right? So when we go to measure the pulses, we always have to measure the rate of the pulse, the rhythm of the pulse, the equity of the pulse and strength. So how many beat per minute? This is the rate. The normal range for adult is 60 to 100 beat. This is the pulse. And heartbeat and pulse beat is same thing, right? Heartbeat means heart beating. When you put your hand over the apical area. And pulse, you can measure from other part of the body, right? Example, radial pulse, popliteal pulse, tibial pulse, carotid pulse, right? or apical pulses. So as I told you, the normal range for adult, it is 60 to 100 beats per minute. But if infant, the pulse rate would be 120 to 160 beat per minute. You must know. So normal heart for adult person, it is 60 to 100 beats per minute. But in case of the infant, it is 120 to 160 beats per minute. Now go for the rhythm. 
When you feel the pulse by your three fingers, you have to feel what the rhythm. Rhythm is regular or irregular. Means when you feel, you can feel the beat, every beat or interval between two beat, the interval is equal or not equal. If it is equal, we said the rhythm is regular. If the interval in between the two bit is irregular, I mean not interval is same, it is called irregular. Same as we have to find it out the equality, right? Equality means the right side and left side pulse is equal or not. Like you measure the pulse the my left hand and you measure the pulse my right hand, it would be same case, same number. If it is not, it is not equal. After that, we have to go for strength of the pulse. Measurement the strength. Usually if we do not feel the pulse to my patient, like patient is dying, patient is uh, shock, pulse do not feel. When it's absent, it is zero. When less than normal, it's called diminished pulse, is one plus. If the pulse is normal, we write two plus. If three plus mean strong pulse, what does it mean to strong pulse? Means when you put your finger, you can feel the pulse is beating your hand, is too full or volume of the blood inside the artery is more than strong, normal. This is hyperdynamic circulation. And when hyperdynamic circulation, if patient has a, any kind of heart disease, of if patient has a fistula, strong pulse. Or if it is four plus, it's called bounding pulse. So the radial pulse will be taken on the thumb side of the wrist, okay? For a patient who has a regular, regular pulse, you can take that pulse for 30 seconds and multiply it times two. However, if the patient has an irregular pulse, you will need to count for a full minute and take their pulse, their pulse for a full minute. For the apical pulse, it's really important to know the exact position where you need to take this. So this will be at the left midclavicular line at the fifth intercostal space. So fifth intercostal space, left midclavicular line. That's where you're gonna take the apical pulse. Again, for a regular pulse, you can count for 30 seconds and then multiply that times two. For an irregular pulse, you're gonna count for a full minute. Also, if they are taking cardiac medications, you're gonna to wanna to count for a full minute regardless of whether they have a regular pulse or irregular pulse. The pulse deficit is defined as the difference between the apical pulse rate and the radial pulse rate. So that's really important. Okay, so in this portion, she, she explaining something super important for your NCLEX board. She explained radiant pulse, Epical pulse and pulse deficit. So we have to know what or where, how to make the radial pulse, or where or how to make the epical pulse, and what is pulse deficit one by one. Pulse radial pulse means take on the thumb side of the wrist. So when we measure the pulse over the wrist, right, in the uh, thumb side, is called radial pulse. For regular pulse, count for 30 seconds and multiply by the two. So we can 
count the pulse for full one minute. So 30 seconds we have to count, then multiply by two means 60 seconds equal to one minute. For irregular pulse, you have to count for full one minute, means 30, 60 seconds. So I said, what is radial pulse? Means pulse over the wrist along the thumb side. What is apical pulses? Apical pulse take a fifth intercostal space at the mid clavicular line. So just below the nipple, fifth intercostal space. So pulse over heart and it's called apical pulse. So what are the difference between apical pulse and radial pulse? This is called pulse deficit. I'm, I own, I'm going to recap it. Epical pulse, we has to take the fifth intercostal space at the left mid clavicular line. For regular pulse, we has to count for 30 seconds and multiply by the two. For irregular pulse, or if the pulse is taking cardiac medication, we have to count for full minute, means 60 seconds. And what are the difference between radial and apical pulse? This is called pulse deficit. So pulse deficit are the differences between apical pulse rate and radial pulse rate. Important to know as well. Okay, so what can cause tachycardia? So tachycardia is where they have a heart rate or pulse over 100 beats a minute. So this can be caused by things such as fever, exercise, medications, pain, hyperthyroidism, stress, and hypovolemia. And then, so those are just good things to know on why your patient may be having tachycardia. As far as braiding,